So recall that in a between subjects ANOVA, we partition the total variance into the between groups variance and the within group variance. We do the exact same thing in repeated measures ANOVA. However, we can take it one step further and we can part further partition that variance in the within group into the subject variability and into the error variability. That reduces the error. And remember when we calculate that F score, it's the uh, mean sum of squares between over error. So if we have a smaller error term, term that F score will go up. We want to get that denominator as small as possible to increase the likelihood of having a significant F value. Put another way. Oh, yep, just said that. So one way ANOVA and repeated measures ANOVA, they both have the total variation. And in both, we uh, disperse it into the between groups variation and the within group variation. For one way ANOVA, that's where we stop. We have to use that within group variation. So this one right here as a denominator. And in repeated measures ANOVA, we have the advantage of we can partition that even further into the error variability. That's hard to read, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, the black box is the error variability and the between subjects variability. Um, and that is our denominator. It's smaller. Obviously, it won't be like half and half. It varies depending on what you're looking at, but I want to do it visually so that it's very easy to understand. So again, we have the between group variation divided by the within group variation for a one-way ANOVA. And we do essentially the same thing in the repeated measures ANOVA, but notice that the box for the error variability is much smaller. That increases the F score. So that's what I mean when the repeated measures ANOVA is more efficient. Here is another visual representation of that. Um, this website that I have in the PowerPoint, and you should all have access to the PowerPoint in Brightspace, um, it goes through this very clearly. I used it a lot when I was making uh, the PowerPoint. So if you find yourself confused, that can be really helpful. But essentially, this is showing that a repeated measures ANOVA just extends the independent samples or the between subjects ANOVA. Independent samples is another term you'll hear when we're talking about a between subjects ANOVA. Now, up until now, we've just been looking at our data and looking at assumptions. Now is uh, the actual, you know, exciting part. So here's the code for the um, ANOVA. There are multiple ways to run an ANOVA, just like there are multiple ways to do lots of things in R. You could run both. They will give you the exact same result. So based on this, is our null hypothesis supported? You're right, you're right. We'll get there, we'll get there. Okay, so here is the output. The F value is a little bit like off-center. The F value is 14.4. That's a pretty big F value. The P value is basically 0.01. So back to Ashley's point, does this mean that our alternative hypothesis about the Nike shoes being the fastest is supported? That's it. This is just the omnibus test. This just says, yes, there's a difference within here. Not gonna tell you what at this point, but there is a difference. So since we have a significant result, we're going to decompose and do the, con the contrast to see if Nike is actually the fastest. So this is the step one. So here's the level command. Basically, when you run this, it just tells you what like columns the three levels of the factor are in. So we probably could have seen this from before, but we want to make sure so that we know that we're doing the correct contract. So it's Nike, Brooks, Adidas. We want to know if Nike, which is this first one here, is faster than these other two. So we have two in the Nike spot and negative one and negative one in the Brooks and Adidas spot. Wow. Is that working? Yeah, it has to equal zero. I prefer not to use decimals. I prefer whole numbers. So you could have put one, negative 0.5, negative 0.5. I prefer to just use a whole number. I could have put like eight, negative four, negative four. 
the actual number you put in here, it doesn't matter. It just needs to equal zero. Oh. That makes sense. Does yeah, that like I guess so? I, I was just curious on like okay. other homework. I think a lot of us were confused how we get those numbers. Uh, and then, yeah, I was just curious. I guess, I guess. So when you, the rule of thumb that I use is that uh, when you are testing one group against the other, the way that I choose the numbers to use is I take the total number of groups. So here would be three, and then I subtract one, and that's the number that I put in the uh, slot for the uh, level that I'm interested in testing. And then I plug in the rest to equal zero. So that's a good rule of thumb, because otherwise it would be a lot of math in your head. As you do this more, it becomes more intuitive. But when you're first starting out, it's like, okay, but like why, why is it sometimes like three and other times it's, you know, two, one, whatnot. So this runs the contrast. And so this is saying, is there a significant difference between the running speed when the sprinters are wearing Nike compared to when they're wearing Brooks or Adidas? And here's the outcome. Is there a significant difference? Nope, no significant difference. Uh, the F value is about 2.5 and the P value is 0.19. So Nikes are not faster than the other shoes. If we were interested in all possible contrasts, so comparing all the different shoes to each other, we could do that with a pairwise contrast. That wasn't part of our hypothesis, but I want you to have the code. So this is looking at all the different combinations. So Nike versus Brooks, Nike versus Adidas, Brooks versus Adidas, and they're all non-significant. Notice here that we have a P value and then we have an adjusted p-value. Here, I chose to do the Bonferroni adjustment, which is a lot more conservative than others. You could do two tests, you could do, what is it, how, ohm, ohm. Doesn't matter, this is just an example. Basically, we're running multiple t-tests, and when we're doing multiple testing, we need to correct for that. The more tests we run, the more likely we'll commit a type one error. So even though this is, well, none of them are significant, in the unadjusted p-value. This one is getting close, but once we adjust for the multiple testing, none of them are significant. And over here, for this code, it will tell you, is the adjusted p-value significant? And S means not significant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Awesome. Any questions about the R code? So why are you doing this? In this example, we didn't need to do that because we weren't interested in all the different combinations. I just wanted you to have the uh, code so that if you wanted to do all those, if you were interested in all the different levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, this is a really good question. So one of the assumptions that I said was that for repeated measures NOVA, you have to have at least three groups. Nathan is asking, can you do a pre and post? Could you just do depression before SSRI and depression after SSRI using repeated measures NOVA? The answer is yes, but that would technically be a t-test. A T test is just a special type of ANOVA. It's easy to forget about the T test because we've been in ANOVA land all semester, but you're correct. You can do it with just two groups, but at that point you could just do the T test. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions about 